So we stopped off last time talking about capacitors, and we're going to continue talking about capacitors basically for the remainder of today's lecture. But we're going to uh, branch out and use the conceptual framework of capacitors to introduce another idea. So first, let's talk about, uh, let me make sure I'm using black. First, let's talk about energy and capacitors. Now, the astute of you um, may have noticed that I forgot to take this part of my notes out of the lecture notes I posted for lecture six, which was last week. Um, that's because we didn't get as far as I would have liked last week, so it was still in the notes. So we're just going to cover those. <laughs> um, so if you've looked, if you looked at the end of last week's lecture notes, um, then you'll see that a lot of this is the same material, right? So one of the reasons we build capacitors in real life is to store energy. And so when I say store energy, what I mean is like you can charge them up slowly, charge them up. We'll we'll talk about that later, and then you can release all that energy really quickly. And so it's a really useful means of storing and transferring energy. It can be very, uh, very useful. And you'll find capacitors in literally every single electronic device, with the exception of some like very, very basic LEDs. So the question is, is how do we know that they store energy? So capacitors <clears throat> are formed by taking two neutrally charged things, usually they're plates or cylind or coaxial plates or whatever. And then you take charges from one of them and put them on the other. So you, so you take the neutral things and you separate charges so that one, one conductor has positive charges and one conductor has negative charges. And then they're arranged in some geometric configuration. And so the reason we know that, there's en that capacitors store energy is because it takes work to, take, to, take, to pull apart neutral atoms and put those electrons with other electrons and those neutral atoms with other neutral atoms. This, this would be like, like you're separating the things that want to be together and you're placing together the things that don't want to be together. And so there, there's a work done that's required to actually do that separation. And in doing that separation, you are storing that energy in the form of, or you're storing that energy in the form of potential energy, which is held in the capacitor. So the question is how much energy is stored? Well, Turns out we know how to figure out how much energy it takes to move a, a very small charge across a potential. And so all we have to do is we just compute the amount of energy that it requires to separate just an infinitesimal amount of charge and then integrate. I don't know why I always have trouble writing on the line on this tablet. So in order to do that, we should conceptualize what that means and figure out how much energy it takes. So taking a charge, dq, this is an infinitesimal charge, across a potential d or across a potential difference, v, increases the energy of the system. by du, which is just v dq. So this is what it means that this is what that potential, this is why it's the electrostatic potential is useful. You can figure out how much energy, how much electrostatic potential energy it, a particle gains across some potential difference by multiplying the charge by that potential difference. So the picture is like you have one lumpy conductor here, another lumpy conductor here. These have some potential difference v because some amount is already separated. Say charge little q has already been separated on those conductors. In order to bring a small charge dq from one side to the other, the amount of energy gained is du, which is just v times or th that potential difference times the amount of charge you're separating. So we're going to assume that the charge um, that when we are moving dq, um, total charge q is already separated. And the reason why we're using the same variable is because this dq is going to increase the amount of separated charge by a very small amount every time you separate one more. 
That's why it makes sense to treat them as the same variable. So now the question is, what is V when plus or minus Q has already been separated? I.e., we need to know what the electrostatic potential difference is. So, so we're trying to figure out how much energy is stored in the separation of charges that is two capacitors. So, uh, two capacitors is just charges separated on um, conductors. And we want to figure out how much energy is stored in that separation. So in order to compute this thing, we need to know what dq is, which is just some given small amount of charge. We also need to know how much the electrostatic potential difference is. And so we can compute that if we know that total charge Q has already been separated. We have a formula for that. In fact, the capacitance is defined as the charge divided by the voltage when that much charge is separated. And so that implies that the voltage is just the charge, the total, the charge that's already been separated, divided by the capacitance. And the capacitance is just a, it's just a number that describes the geometric arrangement of those conductors that doesn't have anything to do with how much charge has been separated or anything. So we can plug that in to our formula for du. So du is just q dq divided by c. And c is a constant. q is the amount of charge that's been separated. dq is the small amount of more charge we're going to separate. So now we can just integrate directly. We're integrating from zero charge separated all the way up to all the charge separated, capital Q. Um, and we're just going to integrate Q dQ over C. And this just works out. It's a simple integral to do. It's 1 half Q squared divided by C. That is the total potential energy stored in a capacitor that has some amount of charge Q and some capacitance C. We can also use this relationship to rewrite this formula. This is just using the relationship that Q equals CV in a multitude of different ways. Uh, we get that the electrostatic potential or the, sorry, the potential energy of this uh, configuration is one half Q squared over C. That's one we just calculated. Or we can replace Q with V by the relationship. Big Q is the total, the total, the, the total charge separated at the end of the day. Yeah, this applies to all capacitors. Notice that this, that none of this required parallel plates. Um, we, so we can replace Q with V by writing this as one, one half C V squared, or we can uh, get rid of the C and rewrite it as one half Q V. When we say that Q has been separated, what I mean is that it's all, there's already positive Q on one conductor and negative Q on the other conductor. Then we're asking how much more energy does the system get if we take a little bit of the negative Q or a, a little bit more positive Q from the negative side and bring it over to the positive side. So we're making the negative side a little bit more negative and we're making the positive side a little bit more positive. Right, so, so all of these, these are all equally valid. They're all equivalent. Um, it turns out that this middle one, that the energy, yeah, capacitance is a geometric property. Um, it, it depends on the configuration of the conductors, right? It, well, it's not just geometric, but it doesn't depend on the amount of charge or on the, um, the potential difference. It's just a fixed thing that depends. Like, if I hand you a physical capacitor, it will have some amount of capacitance regardless of how charged it is. And it, it's just whatever the number is for that particular capacitor, which is based on how the conductors are arranged, what's inside the capacitor, all sorts of things. Um, right, so this one is the most useful. It's not the only one that you'll ever use, but it's the one that you'll use most frequently. And that's because voltage, voltage difference is easy to measure. Yeah, it does change based on material, and we'll get to that today. Um, so there's an example um, that, I'm, that I linked to, uh, which is just calculating the energy in a capacitor. Um, it's linked in the uh, Young and Friedman textbook. Um, also, uh, there's another example on that same page that asks you to compute the energy in a defibrillator which is basically just a fancy capacitor. Um, and then there's a third example that I can, that I can link to you um, or that I reference in the lecture notes, which is just um, <clears throat> asking how much energy it takes to separate two plates that are already charged. There's charge separation Q. Does that mean that there's a difference in the charges of the two conductors is Q? No, no. So, so when I say that Q, Q amount of charge is separated, I mean that, uh, that one of the plates has minus Q and the other plate has plus Q. It's just a language thing. Like 
it, it'll it'll never be ambiguous when it if this was asked in a question. But just as a way of convention, when I say that Q amounts of like the amount of charge that's been separated is Q, I mean there's plus charge on one, plus Q on one, and minus Q on the other. Right. So this is great. This tells us how much energy is stored. What this doesn't tell us is how it's stored. So <clears throat> there's two ways to think about the energy being stored. One of them is that the charges want to unseparate. Let me write this down. So like when we talk about potential energy, it's usually that there is some configuration of something that wants to do something else. And so one way is that the charges, let me just jot this down. The charges want, obviously I'm, I'm anthropomorphizing charges. They don't actually want anything. They want to unseparate. The positive charges want to get back with their negative charges and vice versa. The alternate way though, is that the electric field produces potential energy. The electric field that's produced by that charge separation that produces potential energy densities. And so what I mean by that is that an electric field has the potential to do work. If you want to extract energy from a potential from an electric field, all you have to do is put a charge there and it'll start moving in the direction of the electric field. So in a sense, there's potential energy density, i.e. for every cubic meter of space, there is some amount of density stored in there by that, that you can release by just putting a charge on one end of your space and letting it go to the other end. So this notion of energy density of an electric field is kind of strange, but you'll see from this example that we're about to do that it kind of just pops out of nowhere. So we're going to check the energy density of the electric field in the parallel plate case. the parallel plate capacitor, rather. By the way, I will often abbreviate capacitors cap. Sorry. Yeah, that's true for a vacuum. Yes. Um, so for the parallel plate, for the parallel plate capacitor, oops, oh, all my papers are falling. For a parallel plate capacitor, we've already computed the total energy. Yeah, I know. I, I figured you guys would love that. Um, but unfortunately, that language has been in use for like longer than I've been alive, calling a capacitor a cap. So it's already taken. Right, so we already know the energy. It's 1 half CD squared. The energy stored in capacitor is 1 half CD squared. Also, this is terrible. 1 half C. I don't know why it's like being all jagged. I swear that's not my hand. I swear that's not my hand doing it. It might just be the pen or something. Right. So we know the capacitance of a parallel plate capacitor. We already know that. Um, no, like, like this is me trying to draw. Anyway, well, OK, now it's, it's done. We already know the capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor. If it has area A and the plates are separated by distance D, then the capacitance is epsilon naught A divided by D. God, epsilon doesn't even look like an epsilon. OK, this is getting ridiculous. I'll just write. really slow. Yeah, it's being all jaggedy. And I don't understand why. That's a good idea, actually. Battery out. Battery in. All right, that's marginally better. It, it actually, this isn't an Apple Pencil. This is a Microsoft Surface Pencil. Um, right, so that's the capacitance for an electric field. Um, sorry, the capacitance for a parallel plate capacitor. The voltage in the parallel plate capacitor, well, we just assume that the electric field is constant. It just points from one side to the other side. Um, no, this is actually my wife's and we bought it. Um, and so the voltage in that case, because the electric field's constant and the distance is D, is just E times D. And so we square that. that that's, just, that's just the voltage difference across that capacitor. And so we can rearrange this to write it as 1 half epsilon naught AD times E squared. Ah, much better. It's a lot less terrible. And so now I just want to note something kind of weird. The volume of the interior of the capacitor, well, that's just the, that's just the plate area times the distance, right? It's a cube or it's a rectangle. It has a face side of area A and it has a gap of distance D. So the volume of the capacitor is just A times D 
which means that the energy density in the region between the plates, the total energy divided by the volume is just, <clears throat> which we're gonna call little lowercase u, is just one half epsilon naught e squared. So that would mean that's an energy density and the way that we get energy or the way that we get the, the way that we get anything from that thing's density is we integrate it. So the total energy of the system would just be the integral of lowercase u dv, where v is the volume here. I'm, we're integrating over small chunks of volume. And so we can compute the we can compute the energy or we can compute the energy in a in a capacitor or the energy of any electric field just by integrating the electric field squared times one half epsilon naught. And so um, I'm not going to do more examples of this, but you can do you can check this same sort of thing for the co coaxial cylindrical caps. Big U. Big U. <laughs> Um, you can check this for the coaxial, coaxial cylindrical capacitors. Um, it's done in the Lieber text. And then there's also more examples in the Lieber text, example 2.4.2 and 2.4.3. Um, yeah, is, so, so technically, this is the electric field dotted into itself. That's the same as just the magnitude of the electric field squared. Right. The electric field is always a vector. If we drop the vector symbol, it just means magnitude. Um, but yeah, lowercase u is the energy density. And that's, the that's a common notation. So ex expect to see that more. You'll use lowercase things for densities and uppercase things for not densities. Right. OK, so that's how, that's how you can compute the energy. So in fact, if you know the electric field of some um, arrangement of charge, you can find the energy, the, poten the potential energy stored in that arrangement of charge just by integrating the square of the electric field over the entirety of the universe, turns out. Um, but now we're going to move on to a separate uh, a separate topic. We're going to talk about dielectrics, which are intimately connected to the uh, the notion of capacitors. So that's why it's a relevant thing to talk about. So first, we're going to talk about polarization, which will lead us into this topic of dielectrics. So I want you guys to <clears throat> when we think of polarization, and we've already used this language before when you talk about conductors. You can, so far we've talked about conductors only, like conductors which have all of their charges be free, and then insulators which have all of their charges fixed in place. But in the real world, it's not that, it's not quite that clean. There are most insulators have their, um, most insulators have their charges able to move a little bit, but not a whole lot. So they might be able to shift slightly or rotate or reorient themselves so that you have more charges on one side than on the other, but not by very much. So when we talk about dielectrics, really what we're talking about is we're talking about in, imperfect insulators that have a little bit of charge movement. So in that sense, you could think of a dielectric also as just a conductor that doesn't have enough free charges to completely cancel out the, ex the external field, right? We said that in a conductor, all of the free charges will move until the external field that you apply to it is zero. In a, in a dielectric, you don't have that you don't have enough free charges. So you only cancel out a little bit of the field. And so that, that's, that's what a dielectric is. A dielectric is one of those, um, no, different. Well, most semiconductors are insulators and hence dielectrics at some temperatures or at very low temperatures. Or very, yeah, yeah, very low temperatures, but that's a separate thing. <laughs> Semiconductors are more complicated, um, but so so that's that's what a dielectric is. So this notion of polarization basically is a way of quantifying how dielectric a thing is. So if we place, and there's a lot of words here, and all of these words are in the lecture notes. Don't worry, but I'm just going to kind of talk through it. So let's say that we place a dielectric. Um, oh, it's doing it again. You know what? Let me use my pen. Different pen. Much better. Let's say we place a dielectric um, between two conducting plates. Two conducting plates. And th so 
two conducting plates, remember, can be rearranged. Yeah, it might be a thing. Well, no, it's, a, it's definitely a pen calibration thing because my pen's working fine. Let's say that you have two conducting plates and then you stick a dielectric between them. Remember, two plates is what you need to make a capacitor. So let's say that you put the dielectric between the plates and then charge the plates, however you want to do that. Um, so the electric field that comes about because we charge the plates, polarizes the dielectric. The, those, that, uh, that electric field from polarizing the plates effectively acts as an external field that's being applied to this imperfect conductor of this dielectric material, meaning that some of the charges will separate. You'll get some positive charges near one end and some negative charges near the other, but not enough to cancel out the electric field in the middle. Um, and so the net result of this is that, <clears throat> um, let me write this out, is that we get a neutrally charged center or interior, and we get charge separation on the surface of the dielectric. That charge, that charge that is separated, so you have some negative charges on one side, some positive charges on the other side, that charge has a specific name. It's called the polarization charge. So there's polarization charge, and then there's the other type of charge, which is called free charge. Oops. And polarization charge is just charge that can't go wherever it wants but it can go a little bit of a distance. It's basically stuck in the material that um, it is in, but it can move around just a smidge to, uh, to respond to, it's an on, to respond to external electric fields. Or are you talking about this? That's an of. Um, right, so the picture here, is you have two plates, right? And you have a dielectric that's shoved between them. Just think of it like a, uh, like a slab of material that's pretty close to both edges. And so that dielectric is gonna have just a whole bunch of positive and negative charges bound up in atoms. Obviously this is a, a very crude drawing, but like, you know, maybe it has four atoms. So those atoms are neutral and there's no separation of charges. But the moment we charge the plates, i.e. we put some positive charges on one side, and the way, we, the way we might do that is we might like hook it up to a battery or something. And again, we're gonna talk about that later. Put some negative charges on the other side. The moment we do that, it's not that all of the electrons move to one side and all of the protons move to the other side, but you get a little bit like these atoms kind of just like distort or, or, or warp or reorient themselves. And you wind up with something like this. So the, the atoms themselves are still neutrally charged, but now they're separated a little bit. So here we have that on the edges, we have polarization charge. You have a net negative charge on the left side and a net positive charge on the right side. And in the middle, we have a neutral interior, i.e. it's still neutrally charged. So it's just that neutral bit is now smushed in the middle. So you have a region of charge on the edges that now have positive charges and a region of charge and negative charges. But the whole thing overall is still net neutral. It hasn't gained or lost electrons. So in this case, because, because the, uh, the charges aren't 100% free, i.e. you can't take this, uh, this negative charge here and move it all the way to the left, it can only move a little bit, it's, it, there's not enough free charges to completely cancel the electric field. 
So in this, in that sense, the these are like imperfect conductors or imperfect insulators. Dielectrics are just the middle ground between the two. So the question is how much of the electric field is canceled? And it's it's relatively easy to compute for parallel plate capacitors, but um, we're just going to kind of talk about general capacitors, which have the same sort of effect. They will still have this separation of charges, but it, it'll be, it could get a little bit more complicated. The end result, though, is a, at least for the parallel plate capacitors, would just be you would find the electric field from, the, from each side of the, uh, find the electric field from each plane of charge. And you would note that at least in the parallel plane case, the parallel, parallel plate case, the charges form a plane of uniform charge. And so that will also produce an electric field. And you'll find that the electric field points opposite the field that's internal to the capacitor, that, or that would be internal to the capacitor if that dielectric material weren't there. So, what, so on the interior of this capacitor, from the charges themselves, it'll just, it, it would look like this, the electric field. But because there's some charge separation, you get some electric field from that charge separation, you get a little bit of electric field that points in the other direction. Not enough to cancel it out, but enough to reduce it. And so it's relatively straightforward to actually just relate the total electric field on the interior of the capacitor to the applied electric field and the polarization electric field. The total electric field on the inside, the magnitude, is just the difference of the applied electric field, that's the electric field from just the plates, minus the, uh, the electric field that results from the polarization of the dielectric. Which is just to say that the, the electric field from the polarization points in the other direction of the applied electric field. And this is something that can be verified experimentally. This does happen. And in fact, ex experimentally, we also can, ob can observe another effect. We find that the applied, sorry, that the, pol that the polarized, the polarization electric field, i.e. the strength of the electric field produced by the polarized charges in the, in the dielectric is proportional to the applied electric field. And that kind of makes sense, right? If you apply a stronger electric field to these neutral atoms, they'll separate more. They won't separate completely, assuming that your, that your applied field is not too strong. There, by the way, it is possible to apply so much electric field that you just rip, rip electrons off of materials. We're, we're not in that regime here. We're just we're working with smaller, more normal electric fields. So if you double the electric field, on the uh, or from the plates, then you double the applied, or sorry, you double the electric field as a result from the polarization of the dielectric. It, it seems sensible, right? And so all that all that means is it just means that the total electric field is proportional to the applied electric field. It's just smaller than it, but it's smaller than it in a reasonable way i.e. if you have the applied electric field, then you have the total electric field because the amount that you take away also gets reduced, reduced by two, by a factor of two. And so this relationship between the total electric field and the applied electric field, applied by the way being the electric field that comes from just the, uh, the parallel plates in this case, or just the plates of the capacitor, that relationship lets us come up with a constant that is related to the material that we put inside the capacitor. That constant of proportionality, we call it the Greek letter kappa, looks like a K, it's not, it's a kappa. This is just the ratio of the applied electric field to the total actual electric field inside the, uh, inside the capacitor. And this, this constant kappa is called the dielectric constant. Uh, for that material. So when I was talking about the capacitor depending on the materials that make, make up the capacitor, what I'm really talking about is the capacitance depends on the, on the type of dielectric that's inside that capacitor. And so depending on what dielectric you choose, glass would be an example of dielectric, plastic would be an example of a dielectric, they all have different dielectric constants. They react 
to the applied electric field to cancel it out by different amounts. So some materials will cancel out most of the electric field. That would be closer to a conductor, whereas other materials will cancel out hardly any of the electric field. Those would be closer to a perfect insulator. So this, the, uh, the larger K is, the closer it is to a perfect, um, to a perfect conductor because if the, electric, if the total electric field is near zero, that would, mean, uh, that would mean that the applied electric field is nearly perfectly canceled out, which would indicate that there are more free charges to move around to cancel out that electric, fi that electric field and hence you, it would be closer to being a perfect conductor. Uh, so just as an aside or something to jot down, kappa is always greater than or equal to one. If kappa is equal to one, then it's a perfect vacuum or a perfect insulator, i.e. you cannot polarize something when there's nothing there. Or if it's a perfect insulator, the charges are 100% fixed in place. So, so that the lower limit is when there's no dielectric at all. Kappa is one. Okay, so how do those dielectrics actually affect capacitors? Well, let's say that we have a capacitor with, say, capacitance C, and there's nothing inside it. It has a vacuum between the plates. How does inserting a dielectric affect the capacitance? Because we know it'll affect the electric field. And the electric field is related to the capacitance, a perfect capacitor, a perfect conductor for the larger, a perfect conductor. A perfect, a perfect capacitor is not a thing. How does inserting a dielectric to fill the gap, not to the, so imagine you have a, two parallel plates with nothing between them initially. So there's some capacitance, right? So there's some capacitance. You have two parallel plates, has some capacitance. Now you just shove a perfectly sized slab of plastic between those two plates. How does that change the capacitor, the capacitance of that setup? I, th this is exactly what I was talking about, by the way. This is how the, the type of material will affect the capacitance of a, of a capacitor. So this is one of those moments where if I were meter, I would just say, shut up and calculate. It's a thing that we say in physics, get used to it. And so the way that we're going to do that is we're just going to compute the capacitance the way that we did before. So the capacitance with the dielectric is just equal to the charge on the plates. This is just the definition divided by the voltage difference between those two plates. So <clears throat> once you insert the capacitor, the, the, sorry, once you insert the dielectric, if there were some charges on those plates, there will now be perhaps a different voltage between those two plates by inserting that capacitor. So this would be the capacitance of that newly formed dielectric included capacitor. And the charge on the plates isn't going to change. It's just It just is the amount of charge on the plates. They can't go anywhere, so they just are what they are. But the we can expand or write out what the total voltage difference is between the two plates. It's just equal to an, a line integral from, from one plate to the other of E dot DL. But importantly, this is a line integral of the actual electric field across that line. It is the total, it is the line integral of the, of the total electric field. And we know how the total electric field relates to the applied electric field. It relates by this constant K, or sorry, kappa. God, I'm doing it too. So this is an integral from A to B of 1 over kappa um, E applied dot DL. And so we can factor out that kappa. So we get a kappa out of the integral. And then we get Q on plate. We get the total charge on the plates. That's still not changing. Divided by, but if we factor out that kappa, this is just the applied electric field, i.e. the electric field that would be there if there was no dielectric integrated from one plate to the other. And that is precisely the voltage difference of this capacitor if that dielectric wasn't present, i.e. the voltage difference if it was a vacuum between the two plates. And that 
that result there, Q divided by delta B, that is the capacitance if the plates were separated by a vacuum. And so what we have is that inserting a dielectric increases the capacitance of a capacitor by an amount equal to kappa. If the capacitance is 10 microfarads, when there's no dielectric material between the plates, when you insert plastic, which maybe has a dielectric constant of two, you are increasing the capacitance to 20 microfarads. You just multiply the dielectric constant by the vacuum capacitance. It's, it's a really neat way to neat way to change the capacitance of a of a uh, of a capacitor. Just swap out what's inside. And this should be sensible sensible too. You're not changing the amount of charge, but you're reducing the field because inserting a capacitor produces polarization charges, which cancel out some of the field. And if you have less field, then the amount of field that you get up, that, that you add up when you do this line integral is less. So you have less total voltage. So you have the same charge, but less voltage. And we know the relationship between the dielect between capacitance and those quantities. That would lead to a higher capacitance. So um, I'm not going to say much about this, but we can ask questions about how does the potential energy stored in a capacitor change? So inserting a better, con it's not a better conducting. Well, OK, better conducting in a sense will produce a higher capacitance. Yes, it will produce a higher capacitance. There is a trade off, though. And that's, well, first of all, you don't always want larger capacitors. But the, the other trade off is that dielectrics have, tend to have a lower breakdown voltage than air or the vacuum, meaning that um, it's easier to rip electrons off of capacitors or off of dielectrics than it is to rip electrons out of the vacuum. So you can't put as high a voltage on a capacitor that has a dielectric in it because then because the electrons will just start jumping across the gap if you do that. And we can talk about that in a little bit more detail later. But yes, inserting a better conducting material, a better dielectric, higher dielectric constant dielectric increases the capacitance. Right. So so you can ask how does um, <clears throat> How does the potential energy stored in a capacitor change when you insert a dielectric? And it's, re it's basically the exact same, except now the electric field is different by a factor of kappa. Um, and so when we computed the energy, we had this electric field. We had this term that involved the electric field. And so that, that electric field will change by a factor of kappa. Um, you can see the middle of section 2.5 in the Libre text if you want to see that. Um, and I've also linked some pages where you can see examples of that cal calculation. Right. So now we have a different idea to talk about, which is very, very closely related to, dial to the dielectric constant, which is the notion of permittivity. So you guys may have been already familiar with that word, because I've already said, we've already talked about this idea, or this number called the permittivity of free space, epsilon naught, right? That is the, right, that's the permittivity of free space. And so here we're going to explain why it's called that. So we can account for the dielectric constant, i.e., how the dielectric, how the the, the material properties of the dielectric um, of the dielectric material affect the capacitance in another way. So, i.e., instead of using this constant kappa, we can talk about a different constant, which we'll get to in a minute. So for a parallel capacitor, parallel plate capacitor, sorry. We know that the capacitance, it, when, it, when the plates are separated by vacuum, is just A times epsilon naught divided by D. It's a common thing that we calculated already a few times. If we insert a dielectric into that, into that uh, capacitor, a dielectric with dielectric constant kappa, then the dielectric capacitance, the capacitance of that capacitor with a dielectric in it, is just kappa, as we saw here, it's just kappa times a epsilon naught over d. And so what we do is we just absorb that k and the in, into the epsilon naught. And so we just call this a epsilon divided by d, where this epsilon, this is now called the permittivity of the dielectric. So if we inserted plastic, that number epsilon would be the permittivity of plastic, whatever that plastic is. And so here we've defined epsilon, which is the permittivity of whatever material you're inserting, as just kappa times the permittivity of free space. 
So this is why epsilon naught is called the permittivity of free space, right? The reason it's called that is because it's the permittivity of the thing that we're talking about when you don't have a material in there, when you have a vacuum, hence free space. Permittivity still, it's just a word, but this at least explains the of free space part. And if you wanted to talk about the dielectric properties of plastic, you would say the permittivity of this type of plastic. If you wanted to talk about the, the dielectric properties of glass, you could talk about the permittivity of glass. And these are numbers that you can just go look up based off of what material you're interested in. Um, <clears throat> so what this lets us do, the reason why we do this is when a dielectric is involved, like assuming that a dielectric takes up the entirety of the universe that we're interested in. So like if we're talking about a parallel plate capacitor, assuming the dielectric takes up the entirety of the interior of the capacitor, all we have to do is just replace um, epsilon naught with epsilon uh, wherever applicable. So wherever an epsilon naught comes up, just replace it with an epsilon. And that will give you the answer as if you had replaced the vacuum with whatever per with whatever dielectric of your with whatever dielectric of your choosing. And then you can and then you don't have to worry at all. Um, the polarization charge, you can just ignore it. it. Just pretend it's not there and just pretend the permittivity of free space is actually the permittivity of the dielectric that you're interested in. Then you, you just don't have to worry about it at all. There is one special thing to be careful about when we're talking about this though. And that's that um, whenever a dielectric is present in an electric field, there is a polarization charge, right? And that typically subtracts from the, like that polarization subtracts from the free charge or whatever charge would normally be there without the dielectric. So um, that, that's the charge that's not stuck in the dielectric. So whenever we're calculating a, say a total charge, like in Gauss's law, if you're calculating the total charge enclosed, what we're really talking about is the total free charge um, enclosed. So, and I'll do this as an example, but I just want to write down. So when I write, so when I talk about free charge, what I really mean is charge not bound to a not, charge not bound to a dielectric, or in a dielectric. So it's the it's all of the charge that would still be there if you got rid of the dielectric. So in the example of capacitor, this is the charges that are on the plate. So if you wanted to calculate the total charge on the plate, you would just multiply the capacitance by the voltage. The capacitance would just have its epsilon knots replaced with epsilon. The voltage would just be whatever the voltage is. And that would give you the charges on the plate, not the total charge, which is the free charge plus, in the appropriate sense, the polarization charge. It's a little bit of a caveat, but I just wanted to make that clear because people can get confused about that. So now, so I said I would do an example. So let's do that. Let's talk about Gauss's law in a medium. So now we're going to imagine that we're doing Gauss's law, well, Gauss's law has an epsilon naught, so it might change if there's some dielectric in, in, where we may have thought that there was a vacuum. So let's, let's do this for the simplest case. Um, let's consider uh, near the surface, near the surface of a conductor, with a dielectric outside. This is a dielectric outside of that conductor. So you have a conductor, and then you have a dielectric everywhere else. Missing a word here. Consider. So the picture here is we have our conductor, maybe with some charge. Maybe it's a charged conductor, so it has some charges distributed along its surface, because that's where charges go. And then we have a dielectric. So on this side, we have, oops, we have a conductor over here. And then over here, we have a dielectric, which is just everywhere outside. And there would be some polarization charges, not enough to completely cancel the uh, electric field produced, but there'd be some. There'd be some charges that are polarized. So we could figure out the electric field in this region by using Gauss's law. So we would just draw a Gaussian cylinder 
Here's our Gaussian surface using a cylinder. That's the standard thing to do for a, uh, a plane. And so on the, on the right-hand side, we have three charges. Those are charges that would be there whether the dielectric's there or not. But on the left-hand side, we have these are the polarization charges. So now we're going to try to work through what Gauss's law should tell us. So what is the flux through that surface? So first of all, we should know that the enclosed charge is smaller than without the dielectric. These aren't answers to, the, to that question I just asked, by the way. These are just kind of hints to get us, get, get us going. So the, the enclosed charge is smaller than without the dielectric because there's some of this polarization charge. And that polarization charge cancels out some of the uh, free charge. And then we also know that the electric field through the surface is smaller. And the reason for that is because the total electric field when a dielectric is present is equal to the applied electric field, in this case, that's applied from the conductor, minus the polarization, or the electric field from the polarized, from the polarization charges. And so we would find that the electric field, E total, is smaller in this case. So it kind of matches up. The enclosed charge is smaller, but so is the electric field. So maybe Gauss's law still applies. Indeed, it does. And we're going to find out how. So the flux through our surface, this is the flux through our surface for the dielectric when, when the dielectric is present. This should just be equal to, and again, this is with the standard assumptions or the standard things that we have proved that the electric field points perpendicular to the surface, and it, uh, we, we, wouldn't count the, we wouldn't count the sides because it's parallel to the sides, but it's perpendicular to the end caps and so on, standard Gauss's law stuff. In this case, it would just be equal to the total electric field or the magnitude of the total electric field times the area of the end cap. So I'm going to just write an A there. There's no electric field inside the conductor. There is some electric field in the dielectric. And so this is the flux through the entirety of that surface. Now we know how the electric field, the total electric field, relates to the applied electric field. This would be 1 over kappa um, times the magnitude of the applied electric field. This is how kappa was defined, after all, times the area. And so the applied electric field, the magnitude of the applied electric field times the area, would be what the flux would have been if that dielectric wasn't there. So this is 1 over kappa times the flux for the vacuum of the same setup. But kappa is related to epsilon naught and epsilon by this relationship up here. And so we get that 1 over kappa is just epsilon naught over epsilon. And then we keep the flux of the vacuum. And so from Gauss's law, this is from Gauss's law in a vacuum, which is the only one that we've worked with so far. We have that the flux of this system in a vacuum is equal to the charge on the plate. Because if the dielectric's not there, then the vacuum is, the, then there's just, then the, the only charges would be the charges on the plate divided by epsilon naught. And by the way, that's the enclosed charges on the plate. I'm just dropping the ENC because it's sensible. And so we can relate the dielectric, the flux in the, in the case where there is a dielectric to the charge on the plate and the constant. That, that is the flux for the dielectric in the case where there is a dielectric present is equal to the charge on the plate but divided by epsilon, not divided by epsilon naught, because the epsilon naught cancels out. So the point of this exercise is to illustrate that what, even though we're using Gauss's law and there are these, these uh, polarization charges that are also inside the surface, 
if we just replace the epsilon with epsilon naught, so, so we, we could compute this two ways, right? We could either compute the flux and thus related to uh, Gauss's law by just computing the total charge and dividing by epsilon naught. That, that would work. It would just be annoying. But if you ignore, sorry, that's not epsilon naught, that's divided by epsilon. If you ignore the polarization charges, which you can do, the only thing you have to do to account for those charges actually being there, and thus to get the, yeah, epsilon's a constant. Uh, and thus it's a constant, it, it's a constant that, that depends on the material type. And thus to get the just the flux through that surface, you just replace, you kind of are swapping out polarization charges and epsilon naught, or no polarization charges and epsilon. And that, that trade-off just makes this really easy to calculate the flux if you just know the amount of charges on the plate. So putting this another way, it's smaller. So yes, so, so it's only smaller if you are using epsilon naught. But here, notice that the flux only depends on the charge on the plate. It doesn't care about the polarization charge, which is why the plate. So, so this is not the actual charge enclosed by the surface. It's just the free charge enclosed by the surface. So actually, I was going to write that down. So put another way. You're allowed to take the epsilon naught to epsilon, which is the dielectric or the permittivity of the dielectric in Gauss's law, so long as, yeah, so the epsilon accounts for the polarization charge, yeah. So long as we only count the free enclosed charges. And that's the point. You don't want to count them twice. And the epsilon already, going from epsilon naught to epsilon already accounts for those enclosed, for those polarization charges. So you don't want to do them both. You just, you, you do one or the other. And the easier one is just count the free charges and then use epsilon rather than epsilon naught. And so the formula for Gauss's law in a medium is E dot DA is equal to the free enclosed charges divided by epsilon not epsilon naught. And then the local form is equivalently, the divergence of the electric field is equal to the free charge density divided by epsilon. Let me make that E a little bit nicer. For examples of this type of calculation, by the way, go see sec again, section 2.5, example 2.51. Section 2.5, example 2.5.1. Yeah, that's a charge density. Yeah, rho. All right, so we still have 12, 22 minutes, which gives us not nearly enough time to get through what I wanted to get through, or maybe it will, I don't know, we'll see. So we're going to, we're going to kind of change gears here. So the reason why we talked about dielectrics is because in the real world, most actual capacitors that are in your electronics have dielectrics in them. And so it's useful to be able to talk about what happens to the electric field when there, when there isn't just a vacuum that those electric field lines are passing through. When there's a dielectric present, the electric field changes and knowing how that changes will influence things like how the capacitance of a, of a capacitor changes if you swap out the material inside of it and so on. But that's enough of, the, like th that's basically all we need to know about, um, about media. Um, things will get a little bit more complicated when we talk about magnetism, but we can kind of leave that out for now. Now we're going to kind of change gears. We have the, we, we know what, um, capacitors are and we know what equipotentials are. So we can start talking about circuits more precisely. We're going to start talking about static networks. So <clears throat> when we talk about static, we're not talking about resistance yet. Um, when we talk about static networks, um, we need some way to depict them. So I'm going to introduce some circuit symbols that are commonly used uh, everywhere. So the question is, is how do we depict circuits, like abstractly? Because you could just take a photo of one, but how do you actually depict it so that you can understand it without having to build it? This, this is the question that we're going to answer right now, at least the most, at least at the most basic level, because you know there are a lot of circuit components. Yeah, we're going to draw pictures. We're going to use circuit symbols. 
So first, here's a symbol. A whole bunch of stuff branching off. It's just some random arrangement of lines. Um, so if you see just solid lines, solid unbroken lines, these represent those solid unbroken lines in a diagram represent equipotentials, i.e. every point on those lines has the same uh, electrostatic potential. Uh, usually, these are wires in the real world. So if you wanted to like construct one of these circuits in real life, you would replace all of your solid and broken lines with just like copper wires. And the reason for that is that wires made of metal are equipotentials. All, all metals are equipotentials, and hence, um, <clears throat> hence it's a good replacement, right? Another symbol that you'll see will be something that looks like this. Or sometimes it'll be in the configuration where it looks like this. And this is exactly what it looks like. This is just a hinged line that can be connected back and forth. Um, <clears throat> this represents a switch. So when it's open, i.e. think of it like a door, when it's open, the two lines are not necessarily at the same potential. So you might have like a potential of 30 volts here and a potential of 20 volts over here, right? Because they're not necessarily at the same potential because they're not touching. However, when it's closed, the two lines just become a solid unbroken line and that which forces them to be at an, or to be at the same potential and hence here we have that this is a equipotential in this configuration. It's just a way of, um, yes, this is very different from a transistor. Transistors can behave like this in some situations, but transistors are a lot more complicated. This is just, this is literally like a light switch. In one position, you have two wires that are touching. In the other position, the, the two wires aren't touching anymore. Another symbol that you'll see is a symbol where you have two vertical lines that are separated. This is maybe you might think of it as like a gapped equipotential. Um, this represents a capacitor. The reason it represents a capacitor, uh, yeah, I think this is still chapter two. You can go check the, the approximate course schedule though if you want to see what section we're actually in. Yeah, I think this is the end of uh, chapter two. The reason it represents a capacitor is because it looks like two parallel plate, or it looks like a parallel plate capacitor as viewed from the side, right? It's just a diagrammatic representation of a parallel plate capacitor. Um, and so just as a quick thing to note, the plates, the plates of this capacitor are at the same potential as the wires, putting that in quotes as well, touching them. So like you have a wire here and a plate here. Those two things are at the same potential because they're both just metal pieces that are touching each other. Joseph, some people would strongly disagree. Um, and then there's a fourth symbol that we're going to run into. Um, and we'll see a lot, a lot more later on. But um, the next one that we'll see is a symbol that looks like this. Sometimes it'll have a plus or minus next to it. I'm just going to draw a few more variants of the same symbol that will all be the same. Or just a small bar and a little bar, or a, a small bar and a big bar. All of these are the same. And so this symbol. represents a fixed voltage. 
a fixed voltage difference. Um, and so here we have the, uh, the higher potential. Is that the, is at the larger end. Um, meaning that like, sometimes these plus and minuses won't be written here. So you just look for the end that's bigger and that's where the higher potential is. So if you want to draw in pluses and minuses, you can, and that will just put it on the big side. And then sometimes they'll be stacked like this. That's, it's just a convention. Um, also, if in order to maintain that fixed potential difference, it's, it's necessary to uh, force charges to move from one place to the other, this thing will facilitate that movement. It will give off electrons or absorb electrons to allow that movement to go where it needs to go. And in real life, this is a battery, or it's often a battery anyway. There are other fixed voltage potentials that aren't this or that aren't batteries, but you know, a battery is a good approximation of one of these. Right. So with these four components, the capacitor, the wire, the switch, and the uh, battery, we can actually just start drawing circuits or drawing networks. But before we do that, like the reason we draw these things is because we want to analyze them. So let's do a little bit of analysis before we can even do that. Let's, let's ask what happens if you have multiple capacitors in the same network? What if multiple connect, what if multiple, that's a terrible, that's an even worse M. Capacitors are connected by wires. So the way that we'll analyze these circuits, by the way, is we'll answer questions like, if the battery has this much voltage, how much energy is stored on the capacitors? How much energy is stored on that capacitor? How much energy is stored on that capacitor? Or how much charge is stored on that capacitor? Or how much voltage would it take to get this much charge on the capacitor? Things like that. That's the kind of analysis that we're looking to try to do. And once we introduce more circuit components, we'll be able to talk about more and more complicated or we'll be able to answer more and more complicated questions like how fast does this capacitor charge? Or what is the resonant frequency of this capacitor inductor circuit? And we'll, we'll be able to answer more complicated questions. But right now, all we have is a capacitor, a battery, and some wires. So we, don't, we can't answer a whole lot of questions. But we can still answer some, so we need to get there. So what if multiple capacitors are connected by wires? How do we handle that? So just as an aside, a circuit is a closed loop of components. That's all a circuit is of components and equipotentials, i.e. wires. A network, notice that I said static networks at the beginning, is a combination of many circuits to form a branching system of equipotentials and components. By the way, when I say equipotentials and components, I'm differentiating switches, batteries, and capacitors from wires. Because wires don't do anything. Everything else does something. But by the way, just for ease of language, I'm going to refer to both networks and circuits as the same thing. They're all going to be circuits to me. Um, so before we can actually analyze a circuit or a network, we need to be able to analyze subsections of those circuits or networks. So then we can have an understanding of the parts to build up to the whole. So we're going to, we're going to do that just with capacitors to begin with. So for example, what if, what if two capacitors are arranged in sequence. And what I mean by that is like, what if we have a capacitor here and then we put another one right after it, right? Like what, how does, 
what is what are the properties of this subsystem? So I'm just going to do some labeling here. I'm just going to use colors to indicate the equipotentials. Black will be the middle one, and then I'll use say green for the outer one. Just so just so then you can more easily visualize what the equipotentials are. It's a terrible, terrible blue line. There we go. So here, uh, so equipotentials just mean that uh, there is one voltage that is the same everywhere on that line. So I'm going to, so here we have blue, then we're going to have green below it, and we're going to have black in the middle. So green is VA, sorry, blue is VA, black is, we'll call VB, and green we'll call VC. That is the potential on those equipotentials. So the voltage across these two capacitors, oh, and let's call this C1 and C2. They have capacitance C1 and C2. They'll be called, like their voltages will be V1 and V2 and so on. So the voltage across both capacitors, so the difference in voltage from these, from blue to green, is, well, it's just the difference. So it's, well, uh, sorry, across the individual capacitors, we would have V1 is just VA minus VB, and V2 would be VB minus VC, right? That's just the potential difference across the two, across the plates of each capacitor. So the potential across the combined, combined system combined system of capacitors is, well, call it V total. It's just VA minus VC, right? It's just the difference from one side to the other. But we can rewrite that as VA minus VB plus VB minus VC. All I'm doing is adding and subtracting VB. But this is just V1 plus V2. Hence, we have that the total voltage across two capacitors arranged in this way is just the sum of the voltages on each capacitor. And that kind of makes sense. You go from voltage one to another voltage, and then you add the second voltage to get to the next one. For these models, do we assume the connectors between the kind of, yeah, so these are actually equipotentials. These are not real world wires. If they were real world wires, at least while the capacitors are changing their voltages, there would be resistance and they would not necessarily be at the same potential. Um, so the question then, we can, we can then start asking questions. How much charge is on the plate? Or how much charge is on each plate? I.e., if they have some charge set, if they have some voltage, some total voltage between them, like across both of them, how much charge is on each of the plates? Well, there's a few things that we have to think about before we can establish that. First, the charge on one plate is equal and opposite to the charge on the other. That's, that, that always has to be true for any capacitor. Charge on one plate is opposite its partners or its uh, partner plate. So if one of them has Minus five nanocoulombs. The up, so if this if the left if the left plate on C one has minus five nanocoulombs, then the right plate on C one has plus five nanocoulombs. That always has to be true. Second statement is that the isolated black segment, and it's isolated because it's not connected to anything else, is just a neutrally charged echo potential. It's a neutrally charged conductor, meaning that it has the same amount of, it has zero net charge. Um, net charge zero. Right, it's just, it's just a chunk of metal. It's like we haven't added extra charges to it. And so whatever charges on one side, you have to have the negative of the same amount of charge on the other side. So what this implies then, is that the charge on the right plate of C1, the right plate of C1, is equal and opposite 
equal and opposite the charge on the left plate of C2. Right, so the idea here is that C1's left plate will have some amount of charge on it. And that will force the right plate to have some amount of charge in it because it's a capacitor. But in order to get some charge on the right plate of C1, it has to steal some of that charge from the other side. And so the amount of charge that it steals from the other side is exactly equal and opposite the amount that it stole, right? So you basically just have built-in charge separation because one of the capacitors yoinks charges to, the, to its closest plate. And the reason this happens is fairly clear, right? If you have positive charges here and then zero charges here, you have a piece of metal. And so those charges are gonna wanna get closer, the negative charges are wanna, gonna wanna get closer to the positive charge. And that will leave an abundance of positive charges on the other side. And that, that will mean that the right-hand side of, the, of C2 will have to have the same amount of charge. So the end result is that the magnitudes of the charges on all the plates are the same. And let's just say Q. So every plate, whether it's this plate, this plate, this plate, or this plate, all of those plates have the same magnitude of charge, whether it's positive or minus or positive or negative depends on which plate it is, but it'll have the same magnitude of charge. And so that's true whenever you have capacitors arranged in sequence like this, the, the plates will always have to have the same magnitude of charge. So now we can ask the question, now, now that we know how much charge each plate has, now we can ask the question of, how does the total uh, electric potential relate to the charge on any given plate? So just as a quick reminder, the charge on a single plate for a single, or sorry, the charge for a single capacitor, Q, is equal to the capacitance times the voltage across that capacitor. So what we have here is we have V total, which we already established as V1 plus V2. That's equal to Q, which is the charge on either plate or on, on either capacitor, Q divided by C1 plus Q divided by C2. Factoring out, we get that's Q times 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And so we can rearrange this to get that the total voltage is equal to Q divided by, and I'm sorry, this looks terrible, 1 divided by 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. So the reason we wrote the, 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 the reason we wrote it this way is because we wanted to relate the, we wanted to find the number that you have to multiply the voltage by to get the charge. So when two capacitors are arranged like this, We can treat the system as a single capacitor. As a single equivalent capacitor. I'm underline that because that's a technical term. Uh, and it has capacitance. often written CEQ, which is equal to 1 divided by 1 over C1 plus 1 over C2. And this is called the equivalent capacitance of that system. Anytime you find the effective capacitance of a system, i.e. what's the, how does the charge relate to the voltage, that tells you the equivalent capacitance of that system. Um, we have one minute, so I guess I get, uh, oh, no, no, so I'll, I'll have enough time to finish this bit. So whenever two or more components are arranged this way, and this will be, this will apply, um, for other components too. It's just, we just haven't introduced them yet. Whenever two or more components are arranged this way, like in sequence in this manner, 
maybe also end to end. By the way, most components are going to have two terminals, so it makes sense to say end to end or in sequence. We say, and this is more language, we say those, we say they, that's the word I want, they are connected in series. We will cover inductors near the end of the course. So the language then that we have is whenever, whenever uh, multiple capacitors, whenever multiple capacitors are in series, their equivalent capacitance, i.e. how much capacitance you could a capacitor would need to have to replace that capacitor or that sequence of capacitors, equivalent capacitance is, so say you have five, it's one over one, it's one over one over C1 plus one over C2 plus one over C3 plus dot, 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 for however many capacitors you have. This only applies for capacitors in series. We will get to resistors at some point. Resi when resistors are in series, they have a different uh, formula. I don't know why this box, there we go. They have a different formula that gives us the equivalent resistance and similarly for inductors. All right, I would have liked to have time to go over par or parallel capacitors, but I didn't have time. So we'll have to cover that on Thursday. Um, 